I think we can all say that we've probably been lost at one time or another, each of us. And uh, even the greatest directions, though, um, are not going to do us any good if we don't follow them, if we don't listen to them. <laughs> and I've had some wonderful teachers in my life, in my past, people that have, have been a, a wonderful influence on me, but even the greatest teachers are not going to be effective if their instructions are not obeyed and applied. Well, we've had, um, this is our third, I'm sorry, our fourth week um, in our temple series, and um, Next week will be our final of this particular series here, but three week, weeks ago we started the sermon series on the temple, and these are lessons really that the church needs to look at and, and not make the same mistakes that are being made here. That's really a, a big point. So it, it, I warn us to not look at these and shake our head in disgust and say, oh, those temple authorities should have got it right. This is more for us to look at it and say, and learn from it, and say, what lesson can I learn from this, can we learn from this, to make sure that we're not making the same mistakes that they did? Because we are prone to it as humans. So the first week we saw Palm Sunday um, was the text. Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He goes to the temple. He was not happy with those that are in authority, that those that are in power. They had abused their uh, authority. Second week, we saw the Jewish authorities will not submit to the heavenly authority who is Jesus. They fear men more than they fear God, unfortunately. Last week, we saw that the kingdom of heaven is open to everyone, but few will submit to the heavenly authority. Those who do are to also submit to the earthly authorities while participating in the ministry of reconciliation with the Lord. The invitation of God's salvation needs to take the priority more than anything. Now, going today, we're going to look at three different sections of understanding wisdom, which Jesus, who is the teacher, um, reveals to us. So our first section today is knowing God. So the text says, the same day the Sadducees came to him, who is Jesus, who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. <coughs> So the Pharisees and the Herodians we saw last week have left Jesus, all right? Um, but now the Sadducees are coming forward. It's almost kind of like a tag team thing, it seems like, with all of these authorities at the temple that are coming up against Jesus. Um, and they have the same intent. They're going to try and trip him up. That's part of, we see that by when it says, later that day, that's an indication that these texts are linked. In fact, we're going to see that last week's questioning of the Herodians and the Pharisees, and then today there's going to be three questions also that are going to be asked. Two today from others and one from Jesus. So anyways, but they have the same intent to try and trip up Jesus. <clears throat> they have an agenda, and the agenda is to prove that their concept of no resurrection is valid. That's their intent. So the Sadducees are a high, they're a, a level of, they're the high priests, and the high priests are the ones that took care of the temple for the most part. They're most likely associated with Zadok, who was uh, the high priest associated with King David and King Solomon. He was very loyal to King David. Um, but they're the, the um, aristocrats. They're the ruling class of the Jews. Um, they wanted to preserve the way that things were then. They liked how things were. Rome allowed them to stay in power, to, to stay kind of as a ruling class, and they liked that. They wanted to preserve that. They believed that the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. So the five books that Moses wrote, um, the first five books of the Bible, they say, they believed are the only authoritative books. 
Um, and, and that comes into uh, application here. Um, when they said that they didn't believe in the resurrection. Because the resurrection is a concept that comes out of the book of Daniel. Um, they did not believe that the books of the prophets were authoritative. And part of the reason for that is because the prophets often were talking against these priests and prophets, the false priests, false prophets. And God was revealing that he was angry with them and that he was coming against them. Well, of course they're going to say, well, those aren't authoritative because uh, only the first five books of the Bible are authoritative. Let me give a warning here. Whenever we pick and choose what we want to accept out of God's word, whether it be Old Testament. When I was in seminary, I heard some people actually say, well, I'm more of a New Testament kind of a pastor or scholar. You don't get that choice. The New Testament is written through the lens of the Old Testament. If you take either of those away from each other, you're missing part of the picture and you're just setting yourself up for deception. We treat God with contempt when we pick and choose the different parts of the Bible that we want to accept or not accept. Certain people don't like the books of the judges because there's a lot of wrath that's in there. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of children and uh, women and uh, animals even that are being slaughtered and so forth. They don't like that. Well, there's a reason why it's in there. And it ultimately is to direct us into God's love. But people don't like it, so they don't read it a lot of times. They just avoid it. And you very seldom ever hear any preaching on uh, that particular book. Regardless, they have chosen to not look at the, the books of the prophets as authoritative. So they don't believe in the resurrection. Although they do come to Jesus and they call him teacher. And that he absolutely is. But they're also, they're hypocrites. And we know what God thinks about hypocrites. Hypocrite means actor. So someone who looks one way, but in reality is something else, an actor. So they're referring to here in this question, the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 6, where it says, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man, <coughs> excuse me, shall not be married outside of the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. That's the whole point of it. The name was very important because land was given out to them. If it went to another family, then land would be divided up, inheritances would all be um, mixed up. and So it was a way of preserving uh, entitlement and uh, inheritance and land and so forth and provisions as well for this woman. So um, it ultimately is done in good. It's, it's done to try and, and take care of people. So the brother is required to raise up offspring for his brother to continue the family name. You see an example of this in Genesis uh, 38, verse 8, uh, with the example of Judah and Tamar. Um, uh, so either way, continuing with our text, though, it says, Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third, down to the seventh, after them all, the woman died in the resurrection. Therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Now none of the seven brothers were able to help this woman, providing their children, any children, specifically a son is what they're looking for here. Seven is a very symbolic and important number. It is a symbol of completeness and totality. You see the seven days of creation. You also see seven days in a week. Um, you also see in the book of Revelation where the lamb has seven eyes um, and seven horns. It's mean he sees everything. He knows everything. He has total power. Um, that's all of these things that are here. So therefore, the idea is that all was done to try and help her out by this family and uh, all of the brothers were married to her. It, it fell short, basically. So the woman dies and all the men also are assumed to have passed. 
So the question is, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Now, hypothetical questions, I'm just going to pause here, never really usually work out. I, I should say never work out well in my experience. Um, because it's us trying to play God. Well, what if this happens? And what about this and this happens? Instead of relying on God to provide for us and give us guidance as situations come up and so forth, um, it never has ever panned out in my uh, experience at all because we're trying to play God. So continuing, but Jesus answers them. He does end up answering them regardless. He says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So when he says you are wrong, what he's saying here, this, this word actually means you lead astray, you mislead, you deceive, you cause to wander. So you lead astray. Why? Because you don't know the scriptures. They're supposed to be experts on the law of Moses. And they don't know it, Jesus is saying. They're official temple teachers of the law. And Jesus is saying, you are horrible teachers. They use the law to retain their positions of power and authority as opposed to truly embracing what the law was actually intended for, which we will come back to in a second. They do not know the power of God. The only way that we don't know the power of God is if we're not walking with him. Anybody that walks with God and submits to him for any period of time will absolutely be affirmed in the power of God beyond a shadow of a doubt. <clears throat> these are the worst insults to these Sadducees. He's telling them, those who are supposed to be the experts on God, you don't know God. So in the resurrection, Jesus says, humans don't marry but are like angels. So he assumes that the resurrection is real. You do not know the scriptures must be recognized. We must recognize a couple of different things. Number one, that scripture uses a lot of symbols. I've incorporated that into the preaching here quite a bit to try and reveal what those are because it is important. And I know quite a few, I've heard quite a few very good pastors that skip right over those things. And you miss a huge amount of what's going on in the text if you just skip over those things and strictly stick to a literal interpretation. You fall into a lot of problems and a lot of things that don't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense because it's not meant to be literal. It's meant to be symbolic. So that's one thing. In fact, Hebrew poetic structure is absolutely essential to understand. It's a form of imagery to increase our ability to see clearly what the scriptures are saying. Second thing is that Jesus is referring back to Daniel 12 verses 2 and 3 and this is what it says before this part here that's up on the screen it says and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake this is talking about the resurrection some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt so what it says here you get a chance we see here um, in the slide parallel Ism and intensification is uh, Hebrew, Hebraic poetic structure that's used. So you see here, and those who are wise, what are the wise? The wise are defined by this line down here. They build on each other. It intensifies and gives more meaning to what is going on. So those who are wise shall shine, those who turn many to righteousness. So the wise are those that are turning many to righteousness. Like the brightness of the sky above, like the stars forever and ever. So they will shine like the stars. It's beautiful when you really understand what's happening. And it's used a lot, uh, a lot in scripture. If you, when you see it, you recognize it. Um, but it's, it's either way. So you see that um, wisdom also is something that is, uh, is Jesus personifies. He is wisdom in the flesh. He is the word of God. 
But in Proverbs 8, we see that the wise, it says, will walk in the way of righteousness and have an inheritance with God. For whoever finds wisdom finds life and obtains, excuse me, favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find wisdom injures himself and all who hate wisdom love death. So we're seeing that the wise will be like the stars is what this is showing here. And this is what Jesus is referring back to. The stars are images of mystery. They demonstrate God's awe-inspiring creativity and creation. God names them all. They associated, they're also associated with the children of light, God's servants who take on his image of light. As such, they assist him in his ministry, separating the light from the darkness you see in creation. They also are those that guide in the darkness through the times. They give guidance and direction. Angels in, um, stars are referred to as angels in the book of Judges. <clears throat> in chapter 5, verse 20, where the song of Deborah and Barak says, From heaven the stars fought. Okay, Stars in the sky are not going to be fighting with one another. This is not Star Wars that it's talking about here. These are the angels that are fighting. It's a heavenly war as far as that's going on. It's what it's talking about. And if you know that particular part of Scripture, there was a huge battle that was going on, and they end up winning against some am amazing odds. And that's what Deborah and Barak are talking about, is that it was a heavenly assistance that actually gave them victory over their enemy. Um, so the angels interfered with. They, they intervened. In Isaiah 3, Joel 2 and 3 also, it talks about how the stars will not give their light. So darkness will seem to prevail. Those that are in wisdom, that are like the angels, that are like the light, will not shine like they have in the past. They will be hard to find. They will not be around. The light that shines in the darkness, as we are supposed to be as a church, will be dimmed for some reason, is what that's talking about, that it will seem like the darkness is prevailing. Book of Revelation talks about most fulfillment <coughs> with angels, where in uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 20, it talks about seven stars in Jesus' hand, and they're the angels of the seven churches. Um, it reveals that. Sorry, i got to get a break here. So Jesus even stays within the Daniel text to answer the Sadducees question, he even remains within that same sentence to answer their question of doubt. It's amazing. It's almost like him even tying his hand behind his back and saying, okay, I'll take you all on. I'll even answer the question in the same sentence that you're asking me the question of. It actually holds the answer even within it. So anyways, they do not respect the word of God as being authoritative, all of it. They therefore become deceptive teachers, agents of Satan, hypocrites. They know enough to be dangerous, but are not accurate teachers. So they will be, there will be a new type of existence of humanity in the resurrection is what he's talking about here. So now Jesus is going to, refer, is going to transfer over to um, addressing the heart of their question which is uh, the fact of a future resurrection. So he says, And as for the, the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So when he says, Have you not read? This is extremely insulting to them. It's a rebuke. Because, of course, they've read it. They are experts on the law. They've memorized it. They've read it many, many, many times. <clears throat> but they don't understand it. But Jesus does. He says, What was said to you by God, so that you of all people, he's saying, should understand this. You, the people of God. He's referring to at the burning bush. When in Exodus 3, verse 6, it says, and he said, God, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So Jesus' argument, this is very important right here, is that God would not continue to represent himself as their God 
if he had finished his work with them and abandoned them to the grave. Let me expand on that. The eternal God has a covenant with them. And his blessings and his commitment do not stop at death, but continue eternally. God would not put his name on those who are condemned to death because he is a God of life. He is the God of the living, not a God of the dead, not a God of those that are still under the curse of death, but under those, he's the God of those that have been freed from death. He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Remember, those that are under the curse of death are under the curse from Genesis 3 still. It's a matter of identity that he's saying that they've been identified with God as God's servants. So therefore, if you think that they are dead, you are sorely mistaken. An eternal God has a covenant with them, so therefore they will have eternal life. That's part of the benefit of having a covenant with an eternal God, is that that covenant lasts eternity. It also is a pretty bad thing if you break that covenant because the offense goes for eternity as well. So knowing a lot about a person, my grandmother loved Tiger Woods more than anybody I have ever met before. She knew a lot about that guy, but she did not know him personally. And there's a big difference there. A big difference. These Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians, they knew about God, but they didn't know him personally. Jesus is showing that an intellectual knowledge of the word of God is not enough. His argument comes from it, but it also is affirmed by relations of knowing who God is. So what is the nature of your knowledge of God? Is it intellectual? Is it non-existent? Or is it personal? God wants a personal relationship, very intimate, very up close, walking step by step. It requires time with him. So knowing God, the law is the second section. And this is the heart of this passage. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So the Pharisees are giving another run at Jesus. The Sadducees were just put to shame and the crowds were in awe of his answer. So now the Pharisees are like, all right, all right, let us try again. Let, let me give another shot at this. And they send up an expert in the law. One of their best. And he rightly addresses Jesus again as teacher, because he is. But his intent is to test him. Evil. He asks, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And this is very likely a question that he probably wrestled with himself. That's why he considers this to be a very difficult question, because it was one that he wrestled with. <clears throat> and he said to him, Jesus, that is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. So Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and that's interesting because in 6, 16, just a handful of sentences later, is this phrase, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Which should have been a warning to that expert on the law just a few seconds ago. But this is Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, this is the Shema, which means hear. So hear, O Israel, is what this, there's a few of these actually uh, in Deuteronomy. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They just came out of Egypt with hundreds if not thousands of gods that were there in Egypt. And what this is saying here is your God is one. There are not thousands of God. There's one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart. Now listen, listen to how much of this is, is where God is basically telling his people, let everything that I am, my law, my word, let it consume every part of your life. Let it overflow and reflect in everything that you do. So he says, you shall teach them these laws, these words that I command you today. You shall teach them diligently to your children. So the next generation also remembers this. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So in everything that you do, share these things with your children so that they know what they are. You shall bind them, on your, uh, bind them as a sign on your hand so that all of your work and everything that you do with your hands is reflected, God is reflected in, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes so that when people look at you, they see the Lord God shining back, reflecting back at them. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so they will be foundations and markings which establish your identity, your very home, will be a dwelling place of the Lord. So the number one priority is to love the Lord with all that you are, with every bit of who you are. You love Him. It's a vertical relationship of love and obedience. This is relationship and all-consuming, unlike the servants of the parable last week who were inconvenienced by the call of the king right, to the wedding feast. If you remember last week, the wedding feast was there, the king called out, and they didn't want to end up coming because they were busy. They had other things that they wanted to end up doing. Different here, much different. Let the word of God consume your very being and be seen in every area of your life and teach that to your children. Let it become your very identity. So then Jesus adds a second command, which also embraces love. But this love is for humanity. It's a horizontal love. So we have a cross that's there, a vertical love with God and a horizontal one as well with humanity. And let me say this, when we get this right, when we get right with God first, our love for one another will fall into place as well. We first... If we try to do it the other way around, I try to love others and stuff, I'm not quite right with God, you're going to find that trying to love others is impossible without having God also included in that. It's absolutely impossible. First, get right with God. Make sure that that's established, and then He will help us to have that love, that compassion for one another as well. So, He's referring to, as far as with the love of one another, from Leviticus 19, verse 18, where it says that you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So all scripture, the law and the prophets, he says, depend on these two commands. The word means hangs on everything. And not just the law, not just the first five books, everything. The law and the prophets. So that goes back to what the Sadducees, they didn't believe that the prophets were authoritative. Jesus is saying, oh yes, they are all authoritative. Everything. And all of them hang on these two pillars, on these two studs, on these two foundation marks. Everything hangs on these two. If you want to know what the law is, it all comes down to these two main points. Love the Lord your God with all of everything that you are and love one another. Isn't that interesting? It all boils down to love. Even God's discipline actually is love. But we do the same thing with our children, right? Sometimes we don't like to discipline them, but and you've seen what happens when you don't discipline your children. Those are around. It's not good, right? It's not good. 
Discipline needs to be there, but it needs to be done in love for the intent of helping them, of guiding them, of directing them into life, into the way that is good and away from destruction. When we try to look so close at the law, literally, the law of Moses, the first five books, any, actually any of God's word for that matter, when we try to look at it literally too much and, look and get so intent on it, like to, to pick every part, we miss the big picture. And this is what Jesus is saying. If you, just, if you allowed the law to actually be absorbed into your very being and let God and submit to the law and allow it to transform you, um, we, we will understand that because that's what the law does. The law reflects the nature of God. It is a perfect God, a good, a just God that's trying to bring justice into an unjust place, into a place that's been corrupted by sin. It's not perfect law. It's an imperfect world and that's why it's not always going to be perfect. But it is a perfect God showing us a way of meeting an imperfect world and living in a way that reflects Him in goodness. It's all done in love. Everything. Even the parts that don't, that don't understand, that, that don't sound like it's in love. If you actually understood the context of what, what they're trying to address, we would understand that it is in love. It's done for good reasons, good purposes, good intent. So, if we're doing anything ourselves which does not reflect God's nature in our lives, it's wrong. It is wrong. And we can even take the law of God and change it for our own good. And it's not reflecting God's goodness anymore. And although it might, we might say, well, you know what? It says right here that this is what God says. But we're doing it in a way that's oppressive, that's unjust, that it's excluding people out when God was one that welcomed people in. It's not reflecting God anymore. You're using His law to oppress other people. You're doing what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. If we only have two studs which everything is to be hung on, two hooks, and we try to hang anything on anything else other than those two, it's going to fall. Those of you that have hung drywall before or whatever, you try to hang anything somewhat heavy on anything, a drywall, just something that's going to, it's going to fall. It's going to come down. It's not going to stand. And we do that so often also. The foundation is not strong enough. Does our Christian life and all ex actions get hung on these two studs, these two hooks? The spiritual formation that we've gone through in our Bible study will help with that a lot. A lot. So the last and final section here is knowing the Christ. <coughs> he says, Now while the, the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. So now it's Jesus' turn to ask a question. So he turns to them and he says, Whose son is the Christ? And they answer, the son of David. Their answer is supported by, I've listed a bunch of different things in your bulletin that, uh, where they're quoting this stuff from. And there is some truth to what they're saying, but Jesus says to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? So there's much more to the Christ than what the Pharisees understand. They're lacking in their knowledge. Jesus quotes from Psalm 110. He affirms that this is a writing of David as scripture indicates also. This is a writing of a psalm from David. When Jesus says that David was in the Spirit when he wrote this, he confirms that all Scripture is breathed out by the Holy Spirit. All Scripture is breathed out by the Holy Spirit 
and therefore should be taken very seriously. Those people that say, well, Scripture was written by humanity. True, but what Jesus is saying here is every one of them were guided by the Holy Spirit, and every word that they wrote was guided by the Holy Spirit. Again, if we say, well, humanity has corrupted God's word, so we need to pick and choose what we like. What we're saying is that God is not strong enough for, to protect his word. God is not able to protect his word in time. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Isaiah was one of the most complete books that were uh, found. And it was hundreds and hundreds, like five, six, seven hundred years or whatever, as far as that, uh, from the oldest text that they had found. And they compared it to a more updated text of Isaiah. And the differences were like a couple of those were missing or whatever in it. Nothing at all theologically was missing or changed or adjusted or anything like that. I listed a bunch of other also in your bulletin of passages that confirm that, but especially 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely complete, equipped for every good work. So many of the Jews at that time regarded Psalm 110 as messianic, so it was something that was talking about the Messiah. And here's what it says. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, this is the part that's in our text, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Jesus is absolutely in the midst of his enemies right now. He's surrounded by them all. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. Isn't that interesting? Last week we were talking about the wedding garments that are given to the people of God. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand, and it basically goes on to talk about how he will uh, destroy all of his enemies. So the fact that David calls the Messiah Lord causes some questions. He is much more than just a descendant of David. Much more. The Lord says to him, Lord. He is an eternal priest in the king and king. That's what Melchizedek, Melchizedek was a character out of Genesis that Abraham ended up meeting and he was a priest and a king. That's impossible through the law of God. It's impossible. So what this is saying is that is this Christ, this Messiah will be even above the law. He will be greater than the law. And he has divine power behind him. He is called Lord by the Lord. And he will strike every enemy. All the kings of the earth will fall down before him. He is somebody not to mess around with. He is much more than what they think that he is. He is superior to the law and he is eternal. There's a divine element to him. So, at the end of this then, to conclude our section, it says, And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. <laughs> you are the teacher. No more. No more tag team. No more, let me give it a try. Let me give it a try. Yeah, you clearly do know God's word very well. No one could answer Jesus because his point was very clear and very valid. Jesus clearly has superior knowledge and understanding regarding God's word, and he is the teacher. He is the wisdom of God, the word of God. He's a teacher who never attended the right schools or training. In fact, in John 7, 15, the Jews, it says, marveled at Jesus' teaching, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? 
He never had formal tra training on the Word, and yet, clearly, he knows it really well. He confounds even the greatest theologians of that time and place. Though this was an unanswerable question at this moment, whose son is the Christ? A young Pharisee named Paul, who might have been in Jerusalem at this time, would sufficiently answer this question eventually in the book of Romans. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, of the Messiah, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the thing that the Sadducees did not look at as authoritative, through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, whose son? God's son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. So he was the son of David according to the flesh, and he was declared the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. His resurrection is what affirmed that he was the son of God. And that's interesting because that is what the whole first section was all about. Is the resurrection real? Well, Jesus is saying, I'm telling you with my word that it's very real. But pretty soon here, and that's what Paul is alluding to, is that Jesus will show us in his life by his actual resurrection that it's very real. And that is what, more than anything, gives attestation to the fact that he is the Son of God. So the Christ is God over all. Blessed forever, he says in Romans 9, 5. We're coming up on this Easter season, two services. We have tenebrae, the shadows is what that means, or the darkness. Focuses in on Christ at the cross, the light coming out of the world. Him leading up to the cross. And then Easter is the resurrection from the dead. The very thing that proved that he is absolutely the Son of God. And all who follow the Christ, who overcome the power of death, the curse, he truly is God of the living and not of the dead. Those that are enslaved to Satan are those that still belong to the dead. The resurrection identifies Christ as the true Son of God. And God's Word gives us the detailed directions on how to get home. But we must listen to it. Even the greatest teacher's advice won't do us any good if we're not going to follow it. If we're not going to listen to it. So, that is the question here today. When we pick and choose what we want to listen to, we get a partial picture and we're easily deceived and misled. We remain lost. We end up not knowing God. We remain in the curse. We remain dead. All of his word is important. Jesus, we need to remember, is the teacher. And we must follow the teacher so we know God in truth and we know how to get home, how to have eternal life. And if we remember, John 17, 3 says that eternal life is that they know you, the only true God and he who he also sent, the Christ, his son. We must identify and follow the teacher, Jesus, if we want God's salvation. Knowing Jesus is walking with him, being transformed by him, submitting to the Messiah, the Son of God, that he has the power to even resurrect the dead to breathe life back into the dead bones that we hear about in Ezekiel, to bring them back to life, to resurrect. Amen? Let's pray.